Let's give a round of applause, please, for Maria Teresa Kumar. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. And before I get started, actually, I want to recognize Fabio, because when we talk about our media partners, Fabio, from the very beginning, has been one of our incredible stellar partners. And when he talks about the ability for folks to really get, to each other, get together, innovate, and move each other upwards, he was, one of the, he was literally one of the visionaries when we actually gave him an idea. Lothar Latino was very little less than that. And I want to thank you and recognize you, because you talk the talk. So thank you, Fabio. <laughs> So the journey with Voto Latina was some, one of the things that you know, came by accident, but what I want to walk with you is really look at this idea, TED, big ideas. What does that mean? Whoops. Right click. There we go. So we keep hearing this number, 50.5 50 million Latinos. That's what the census said. In 10 short years, we catapulted from being the third population to the second largest population. But when we start looking at what that means, we actually exemplify the true America. We have a lot of people right now, a lot of naysayers, that, Latino, that America is on decline. And I actually say that the Latino community is a silver lining of where we're going in our future. Because we're young, we're workaholics, we believe in America when everybody else doesn't. Despite our economic difficulties and educational needs, we profoundly believe in what America is and the possibility and that immigrant belief. And it is because of that that I think that America's best days actually lie ahead. We constantly hear that China and India are going to eat our lunch, that they have the largest emerging market. But guess what? The largest emerging market is right here within our borders. And how do we tackle it? 50 million Latinos who are bicultural, bilingual, and hungry, with connections not only with here in America, but also in Latin America. Right off the bat with India and China, we have better health care, better educational system. Sure, do we need to improve our educational system to compete globally? Absolutely. But when you look at China and India, India has one of the highest illiteracy rates, and both India and China's population, for the most part, live in abject poverty. So how do we start thinking together to make sure those 50 million are getting educated and competitive, not just in the U.S., but in the almost billion people when you combine North America and South America? The United States is the lar third largest Latino community. We're the wealthiest Latino community. When we start talking about looking at Latin America as an opportunity, they've actually been sheltered from this whole idea of the financial crisis. They have a growing middle class, but more importantly, they're making innovation in media, technology, education. How do we learn from each other? And something, a little seed to plant. What happens if we don't take advantage of our 50 million plus and growing when my parents stop paying remittances to Latin America? There are opportunities there. Right now, Latinos, the 50 million strong, carry on their backs the economies of Mexico, Dominican Republic, and El Salvador. How do we continue taking advantage of that to make sure that our biculturalism, our bilingualism, are, are an asset? There's a, there's a small town in Iowa that recently became the very first uh, Latino dominant town. It's called West Liberty. They saw the trend 14 years ago and revolutionized their school system. They actually allowed bilingual, bicultural classes by choice. And now what you find is not only Latinos learning bicultural, bilingual, but you see many Anglo communities, Anglos coming in and wanting to take advantage of that same school system. That's forward thinking. And it's forward thinking that's going to set us up for the 21st century. Right now, Latinos, with that hunger and that entrepreneurial spirit, we're the fastest purveyors of small business. Not only were the fastest first purveyors of small business, but we also believe deeply in investment. There's an opportunity there when you start talking about, while we may be banking, we're not investing in the capital markets. How do we start learning about the capital markets? How do we start investing and creating wealth creation? Latinos are the fastest adopters of technology. I don't have to tell you guys that. In 2010, 
Way before the Arab Spring, you seem to forget that Latinos were among the first groups worldwide to organize via text messaging and MySpace. Young people organized back in 2006 when they felt that their families and their lifestyle and the fact that people were saying that they were not American were under attack. And they organized peacefully. Two million people, the largest civil rights organizing in our nation's history. Technology facilitated it, they organized it, and they believed it. So what's going to happen when these two million plus start flexing their muscle at the ballot box? What's our possibility? Right now we're seeing in the United States a huge generational divide. 84% of, of elderly folks, 65 and over, are white. 39% of millennials are diverse. 17% of that is actually Latino. We're living right now in a historic time where this is the most diverse America that we've ever seen. And it's not surprising that there's increasing legislation that's divisive, because unfortunately, the, the average age for a member of Congress is 62 years old, white male. They're not seeing themselves in this room. So we need you running for office. I'm not kidding. <laughs> But we also need to make sure that we're being held, we're holding folks accountable and we're mobilizing and we're engaging. By 2020, 95% of all teen growth is going to be Latino. That's empowering, but we may need to make sure that they have the skill set that they need in order to be competitive globally. This is the 2008 electoral map. Colorado, Florida, Virginia, and Pennsylvania and we're, I forgot Nevada right there, they were usually red states or swing states. For the very first time, Colorado became a swing state, a purple state. And it was all because of the Latino vote. When Colorado got called, we all knew the election was done because we didn't need to wait for Florida anymore. They switched it. The 2012 election is going to be that much more exciting because that electoral map that you see here is done. Why? Because of the booming Latino population in states that people would never have imagined all of a sudden existed. Indiana, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Texas alone received four new electoral votes, three because of the Latino population. Now. Are they going to recognize the Latino population? We're working on that. This is the electoral map. You notice from 2008, those were basically, that, those were the safe seats. Here, we see much more of a, of a, of a toss-up, excuse me. But that's because, strictly speaking, the majority of it is because of the Latino vote. Senate races, six of the 10 expected most contested races, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Florida, it's going to be because of the Latino vote. Jersey in the house? <laughs> in these states alone, Wisconsin, Virginia, Connecticut, I'm missing one, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado, these states alone, two million unregistered eligible voters. Let me drill down to you why this is significant when it comes to our presidential politics. In Texas in, 2012, in 2010, there were two congressional districts, 23 and 27. They won, the candidates won with less than 1% of, of the vote. They won by margins of less than 1,000 voters. 80,000 and 60,000 Latinos, respectively, were unregistered voters. This swings elections. Our participation of the lifestyle that we want to see for our family and our future swings elections. Now in 2012, we're going to see a lot of challenges to the ballot box. One is ACORN. ACORN, unfortunately, is no longer with us. It was defunded by Congress. But they represented 25% of all registered voters in 2008. They disproportionately registered Latinos and African Americans. Now, just as you saw the electoral map change, because you saw all these new congressional districts in the states that I mentioned before, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, and the list goes on, 
unfortunately are passing very stringent anti-voter ID laws. What you're finding, for example, in Texas, is that you, can't, you can be a student, but you, it's not enough for you to go to the polls and show your student ID. But if you show your NRA card, that's OK. The next crisis that no one is talking about is the foreclosure rate. There are roughly 18 million people that were homeowners and voters in 2008. We have to find them and get them re-registered, and we also have to make sure that they have a valid ID. Most folks go, they don't, they don't think about losing their home and all of a sudden going to the DMV for a, new vote, for a new ID. So we're working on how do we actually make sure that we get that message out. And I encourage you, if you know anybody you've moved, who's moved, or if you've moved yourself, please make sure you're re-registered. Some of the challenges. Only 39% of all eligible Latino males vote. There's 22 million Latinos that are eligible voters this election cycle. And the men aren't participating. And we're scratching our heads to figure out why. Latinos, on the other hand, we're close to 56%. We're not perfect, but we're still we're inching along. And these are some opportunities. 50% of the Latino vote is under the age of 40. We have roughly 1.2 million Latinos since the last election, 2010, to the coming election that are going to be eligible voters. 50,000 Latino youth turn 18 every single month. That's a congressional seat, 1.2 million. Since 2008 to 2012, Latinos would have made up two more congressional seats. That's political power and opportunity. This is some, one of the ads that actually is also motivating and I also see as an opportunity. In, 2000, in 2010, Sharon Engel went off against the Latino community in Nevada, seeing it as an opportunity not only to divide the community, but also to speak in code that Latinos were not American. In 2010, her, her, she was actually getting a huge infusion of capital from all around, the, from all around the, uh, the country, mostly from Chief Hardy candidates, and she was neck to neck with Senator Reid. What happened, though, when she started showing these types of advertising is that the Latino community mobilized. They felt attacked, it became personal, and it says, you're not going to tell me that I'm not American. And people ended up, Latinos ended up voting 9 to 10 against Engel, not so much for Reed, but because of her vicious attacks. And keep in mind that people overwhelmingly voted for a Republican, including Latinos, for governor in Nevada. Sharon Engel did the exact same tactic that Pete Wilson did in, in 1993 against the Latino community in California. It was Proposition 187, basically talking about racial profiling and what an American was. People forget that up to that point, California was a swing state, mostly Republican. But what these ads do is that they all of a sudden have the Latino community raising our, our heads from our hard work that my family and everyone's family does every day and saying, you know what, you're trying to tell me I'm not American, but I deeply believe in this country and you are not going to portray me in a way that's not beneficial to myself or my family. And it's these opportunities that I believe that 2012 is going to be so interesting because it's going to be an election not about a candidate, but about issues and about making it personal. Alabama just passed what the New York Times called one of the harshest immigration laws of the country. There have been incidents where young kids are getting pulled out of the classroom and asked for their immigration status, regardless if they're American or not, just simply being Latino. And it's those stories that are worth spreading because that's what's going to galvanize not only Latinos, but Americans who really truly believe that no one should be questioned about their Americanness by the color of their skin. So what is Voto Latino doing? We're going to start infusing technology, and I recognize it's a rough transition, but I'm almost running out of time. <laughs> but what we're using is we're going, to be starting, we're going to start using a lot of technology for both canvassers but also young people themselves, so they can actually start spreading their ideas of voter registration, where they vote, where they can participate, and engage them in can with the candidates, but also issues for mobilization. In order to get to the Latino vote, you have to use the latest technology, 
you have to talk to them in English for the most part. 80% of all eligible Latino voters are English dominant. You have to make sure that you also do peer-to-peer. -peer. Because while technology is fantastic, we can never forget that it's just a tool. And also find the individual and talk to them. The majority of the reason that Latinos don't vote is two reasons. One, they say that no one's asked them. We're asking. Two, it's because they feel that they don't understand the issues. So with the combination of the, these applications and a whole 360, we want to make sure that Latinos are informed and empowered, and that they spark conversation around the kitchen table. Just like Alabama's laws and the Arizona laws are sparking those, those questions and that unease, we need to be able to find solutions. And one of the solutions is flexing our power at the ballot box. When we start talking about the issues of jobs, ending the war, education, healthcare, environment, and small business, none of these pieces of legislation, of policy, that reflects the next century of America can be done without the Latino vote. People are constantly thinking that Latinos are a fringe group. You heard Fabio. You saw the 50 million. You saw where the growth is. It's not a fringe group. We are the next generation of Americans that are proud to be here and truly believe in the bottom of our belly that America's best day is lie ahead of us. So thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much, David, for putting it together. Thanks. Gracias.